This is The Boys Podcast from TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about The Boys Season 2, Episode 7, Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Maker. I feel so stupid. I gave my whole life to nothing. That's not true. Mom, the good guys don't win. The bad guys don't get punished. What we do means nothing. It's just all for money and... I am in the middle of all of it. Alone. Honey, you're not alone. You're not. Let's go away. You and me. Let's let's get away from all of this. Get away from thought. Escape for a while. Mm-hmm. I cleared it already. You cleared what? With, with Ashley at Vaught. You called them? Y- yeah, about an hour ago. Why? Mom, they, they could be looking for <laughs> Welcome back, boys and girls, to our discussion about The Boys, Season 2, Episode 7, Butcher, Baker, Candlestick, Maker, the mind-blowing episode of The Boys. I'm (laughs) one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow boys and girls. I'm one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out this trio of uh, explosive, mind-blowing podcasters, I'm Chris. There you go. I wanted to get in there with the mind-blowing... jive before anybody else did (laughs) i think everybody's to be fair anything we opened with now would have been uh more upbeat Mm -hmm. than the opening we got of this episode that's very that is very true yeah yeah Yeah, this is going to be our spoiler filled discussion we will be talking about everything to do with episode seven of the boys make sure you watch the episode as we always forget to say before we spoil stuff Um, but go watch it see what happens come back and uh, join us for our discussion um but yeah this is a big one uh there we are on the penultimate episode of the series a second season of the boys uh, there has been a third season confirmed, so uh, so there is more boys coming. Um, but yeah, this is a a significant episode, really. Yeah, just before we hit record, I was actually just saying, I was like, I was convinced this was episode six mm-hmm. in my head. I'm like, oh, it's fine. We've got two hours left. They can tie up a few things in another two hours. And it wasn't until we came and started recording, I went, what's the episode number? Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. It has oh. whizzed by. It has, absolutely. Speaking of episode yeah. six, though, we have uh, to kick off our podcast, a little correction on our discussion from last week's episode. Uh, one of our listeners, Chris Aggie, sent a message to us on Facebook to say a small correction on episode six. The dagger Stormfront has in the chest is not an SS dagger. It's a Hitler, Hitler Youth League of German Girls dagger or knife. Uh, SS daggers have another form. Um, there is no red in the symbol, the red and white insignia in the ha- in the handle is actually the Hitler Jugend or Bund Deutscher Mädel symbol. Uh, makes sense in my view because if Stormfront was born in 1919, she would have been the age of this group, the Hitler Youth, uh, in 1930, kind of 11 years old, uh, when Nazis took over Germany in the early 30s. Thanks so much for that, Chris. That's a really good, uh, really good catch. Um, I know when the guys were talking about uh, the knife or dagger that was in uh, Stormfront's uh, chest last week, I was sitting there kind of going, I don't even remember that. I was kind of focused on the photograph that was in the chest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, I think for, for me, I it was just the certainty that it was some kind of Nazi dagger mm-hmm. uh, the, for sure. Yeah, Chris, thank you so much. Anyone, if you ever have any corrections, please feel free to send them in because it's great. The more you know, as uh, G.I. Joe used to say. Um, but uh, no, on a ser- serious note, when I was uh, when we saw this feedback, I went, so why, where is it? Where did I see it? Where did, I, where did the SS bit come? Uh, Jojo Rabbit, which I had watched only recently. I say recently. Time is a straight line and a curve and wibbly wobbly now in COVID times. Um, it was about six months ago I watched it. Uh, but, uh, it was interesting to see that, um, uh, yeah, it, w- it was in there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, thank you so much, Chris. Yep. Good stuff. Um, some good news, guys, before we get into the episode discussion. An announcement was made this week, just after we recorded, that a spin-off to The Boys has been announced and fast-tracked by Amazon Prime. Um, there is, it is going to be coming from the executive producer, Craig Rosenberg, uh, who wrote this episode, actually. Um, 
It is a spin-off set in a college. Uh, the official uh, kind of synopsis or line that came from the article from Deadline says, uh, set in America's only college exclusively for young adult superheroes and run, of course, by Vault International. <laughs> the untitled boys spin-off is described as an irreverent or rated series that explores the lies of hormonal competitive soups as they put their physical, sexual and moral boundaries to the test, competing for the best contracts in the best cities. Part college show, part Hunger Games, with all the heart, satire and raunch of the boys. <laughs> Good that, stuff. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I am so getting ideas that they're going to do the G-Men and they're going to do Teenage Kicks, which are the two teenage-based uh, kind of uh, superhero teams. One is the spin on the X-Men, mm -hmm. obviously, and the other is kind of the Young Avengers. Teenage Kicks is kind of like that Young Avengers and... I, I, I'm here for it Absolutely. on all levels. Absolutely. It sounds so interesting. Uh, they didn't get much coverage in the actual comic books. <laughs> they existed in there. There was some stories with them, but uh, it'll be really interesting to focus on, on them for a they TV were, show. In the first arc, the, uh, Teenage Kicks was definitely uh, given an old uh, uh, runaround. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you uh, have read that first arc, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's uh, really good news, though. I'm really excited for that. So we have uh, season three coming and a spin-off for, for the show once uh, filming can get back. Uh, in the world of the boys, I suppose. So 2025! Yeah, something Yay! like that. <laughs> something like that. Let's get into our discussion about this episode. As I said, the uh, explosive, head mind blowing episode of the boys. Uh, season two, episode seven, Butcher, Baker, Candlestick Maker. Uh, the episode was written by, as I mentioned, Craig Rosenberg. And it's the fourth episode that he's written for the boys and the final one, I think, this season that he's written. Uh, the episode is directed by Stefan Schwartz. He directed season one, episode five of the boys, Good for the Soul, which featured the infamous laser baby uh, which has now become a uh, a game on uh, your android and apple device where you can blow up uh, <laughs> blow up fbi agents with uh, the laser baby's eyes <laughs> there's also a toy now that lights yes. up in the dark i kid you not i went looking and i was like Oh my god, if I if I had the body for a cosplay, I would so do this. <laughs> laser baby. I love it, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I Just it. I, I would actually cosplay as the laser baby <laughs> with another lazy baby. It'd be like that inception thing. It's like a lazy baby with a laser baby dressed as a laser baby. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm, I am saying that I'm a laser baby. Okay. All right. We will. Uh, we Moving will swiftly on. Exactly. Up. Exactly. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for the episode? Sure. Homelander and Stormfront further their master plan for Compound V by whipping up fear and suspicion across America. The super couple also begin to muscle in on Becca's son Ryan with frequent visits to her house. After telling him the truth of his life and promising to be a happy family, Homelander and Stormfront fly off with him to the distraught cries of his mother. Elsewhere, Huey is babysitting Lamplighter as he is forced to help Senator Victoria Newman make a case against Fort. As they pass the time between soup porn and news, Huey receives the terrifying news that Starlight is being held by Vought as a traitor and convinces Lamplighter to help him rescue her. At Vought Tower, Starlight gets rescued, but it all becomes too much for Lamplighter, who cooks himself. After the Lamplighter misfire, Mallory and the boys are forced to look to an unlikely source for answers and strong-arm Dr. Vogelbaum to testify against Vought at Newman's Senate hearing. At Capitol Hill, as Vogelbaum takes the stand, the hearing gets explosive. And very, very bloody. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I Paint the walls. Exactly. I wonder if in the behind the scenes stuff, I wonder where some of those explosives set off and the actors didn't know because their, re their reactions as they just get covered in blood are fantastic. Every every one of them that just gets uh, a bit of explosive blood on them. Uh, hilarious stuff. But, uh, but also... Like, what a shocking ending to uh, to a pretty shocking episode, really. It does explain we discussed the uh, a, a similar powered individual escaping um, Shady Groves, as I keep calling it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not Shady Grove. It's the, the the mental institution or the, the, the asylum where they were being held yeah. in the previous episode. It does explain why she was hitchhiking. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we probably will talk about that a bit later on uh, as we get yes, into the points from the episode, because I think that's likely who it is, but we'll we'll definitely talk about it. Let's start off with our points for the episode, Chris. As usual, you kick us off with our protagonist, Boys Moment. What's your, uh, what's your Boys Moment for the episode? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get my singing voice ready. Do, do, 
do 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 if that is so out of key, you do not know what I was humming or at least uh, trying to attempt to sing. Uh, it is Mission Impossible. Or I should say Mission Impossible for Huey. He has a mission, if he chooses to accept it, it is Save Starlight. Um, I really just wanted to talk about the the interceding moments from um, essentially where Huey and Lamplighter are uh, engorging themselves, or Lamplighter anyway, Lamplighter, uh, yeah. in terms of uh, the uh, extracurricular daytime um, adult entertainment, mm. all the way to uh, the escape. So I just, I really enjoyed this mm-hmm. because this did feel like the worst potential idea in the world Uh like every aspect of this was like this is gonna end (laughs) badly for all of them yeah i was just like definitely like okay he's gonna get captured she's gonna be captured it's gonna be like this thing homelander's gonna soup it um and no so what we do see is like the as the john said in the summary huey sees that starlight's been imprisoned she's being branded the traitor uh, Lamplighter conveniently goes, oh, I should probably be held in this one cell that kind of deadens powers and mm. blah, 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 blah. And they decide, okay, we have to save her. So it was then discovering that there's like a service ele- uh, elevator entrance uh, for kind of uh, going through the pipes. And that's how uh, Lamplighter and A-Train used to smuggle in uh, co-ed girls, college girls. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're kind of like, Really? Okay. Even here he's like, really? Um, <laughs> all the way up until where Lamplighter decides to be a hero. Mm-hmm. I I literally thought he was going to he- like human torch it. Right. So we do see him like get distressed by that they've removed his statue. Mm-hmm. And he then, yeah, like whoo, um, human combustion or barbecue or whatever way you want to call it, extra crispy. Yeah. I thought for a second, it was like, oh, cool. They're expanding it out that maybe he is Human Torch. He's able to kind of, he only ever just kind of controls the fire okay. like that. That's where my head went. Right. When he drops to his knees and starts crying yeah. or like. Screaming. Like, oh, yeah. screaming. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, interesting yeah because he says just beforehand that he's not just annoyed that they've removed a statue he's annoyed that they've removed a statue because he wants to do this right in front of the statue of himself so they know exactly who he is um he wanted to make his father proud he never got to make his father proud is what he's saying and he wants to set himself on fire and kill himself right there in front of where the seven have all of their meetings so that it will kind of bring that light to them i guess well, I suppose as Victoria Newman said, and you're the victim here, Lamplighter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ultimately, yeah, the, there's all this going on, but, um, he's pretty egotistical. Oh, yeah. Uh, even just to have, have his death in front of, uh, his bronze figurine, uh, and, you know, in the, the conference room. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. Farewell. I, I thought he was going to race out the window and fall a bit like, just because we had, um, we did have Denneth here in this episode, we did. Uh, so I kind of did think a bit like Lord of the Rings, he might go crashing out the window and we'll see his good. flaming yeah. body uh, fall down all those 99 um, flights, flights yeah. Yeah, or I, floors. Uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking, since this is the boys, I kind of thought that his attempt at suicide wouldn't go very well, and we just have a very yeah. crispy well, that's uh, true. lamplighter for yeah. the next couple of episodes. Genuinely, it wasn't until Huey needed a hand... Um, that I that I uh, realized, okay, Lamplighter's not coming back for this yeah. one. That's the bit I thought was just so funny. It was just like I was like, "What's he doing? What? Uh oh!" Uh, uh. <laughs> and it was it's perfectly encapsulated where he he beats Annie's mother. Yep. And <laughs> yeah, that was he, so she's funny. like, "What's with the ha- hand? Is that a human?" And then hand? when he he waves at uh, when Starlight frees herself and gets out and finds them, uh-huh. like he waves using the hand. Uh-huh. <laughs> He holds the hat, he still holds that, and he waves with that. This is why I like Kripke. Like, he, he has a vision of the boys, and it's that kind of, they, they've really solidified themselves as this very topical, very deep hitting, uh, when it wants to be mm-hmm. kind of show. But at the same time, it's completely able to t- look, take the irreverent Mickey out of itself. Oh, absolutely. Like, they, they know, 
like how over the top some of this is uh-huh. in terms of but it's the same thing like if you did have to get someone's hand for a hand printer <laughs> you would be carrying a hand around yeah and it's just like people would go yeah what why what <laughs> like absolutely and, and i you know huey's changed a lot you know huey would probably be completely freaked out by that in episode one of season one <laughs> but now he's kind of like yeah. you know waving the hand in the air as at his former girlfriend uh oh definitely sparks flying again between uh oh between, yeah uh, the two he of them he came to save her exactly oh what are you doing here huey Oh, nothing, you know, <laughs> just here to save you. you know. And it, it's good to know that Crunchy Lamplighter Hand also works on Still the scanner. <laughs> so yeah, I their scanners, that. yeah, they, Vought maybe doesn't have the top notch security that we think it does. <laughs> um, in well, all it, honesty, well, they didn't even lock it out for after two years or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Years since he was gone. <laughs> yeah. you know? So uh, impressive. But stuff. they probably like locked out Starlight because you're like. All right. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this was just, I, I thought it was really fun. Absolutely. But remember, we did talk about it before. Lamplighter is still a member of the Seven overall. Technically, he was supposed to be still on a mission. Was that what we said last mm-hmm. episode? Um, he's supposed to be still on a mission for them. He's not being declared dead or kicked out of the of the Seven, I think. That's true. Um, so, whereas she has been declared, you know, enemy number one. Sort of privilege uh, rights, almost, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, something like that, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Chris, anything else on uh, on Huey's Mission Impossible? No, I just, I really just enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. It was just a... Now, it ended terribly, it terribly because the Star Witness is gone. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, as you said, the sparks are rekindled. Mm-hmm. That, um, that lost, that potential lost love, that at the end of the beginning of this season, we're like, okay, they're not getting back together. This is, they are now becoming that Ross and Rachel. Will they, won't of they? Of course. It's just like, yeah. they, they're on again. They're off again. As I said. Literally, I'm just waiting for one of them to, like, in season three, I want, we were on a break. Well, I want uh, that. <laughs> I, I still think the better reference here, because it's a sci fi comic book show, the better reference here is Fitzsimmons from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., where they will just constantly find reasons to keep them broken up and getting back together for five minutes and then break it up again or going off the other side of the universe and breaking them up that kind of way. So, well, it certainly yeah. went all melty, didn't it, in mm-hmm. the corridor with, with uh, Starlight's mother there. It, yeah. the, the music all went kind of lovey dovey and soft. And it, it, it's testament to this, this show because. Like you were saying before, Chris, I was kind of half expecting Homelander to come in and just slice through um, Starlight's mother or mm-hmm. something like yes. that. Um, I, I yeah, I just did. <laughs> this is the boys. You can't, um, you can't uh, sit back and think everything's going to go fine. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, as well, you don't put Huey in charge of protecting uh, your, your witness. I think, <laughs> yeah. um, hopefully, Billy Butcher has has learned that, but certainly. In the immortal words of Mallory, she does say, Hugh burnt our star witness. Yep. <laughs> Love that it's just, oh, uh, it's all his fault. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically. Hopefully another plan. Um, John, do you want to give us your boys or protagonist moment for the episode? Yeah, it was just uh, Mother's Milk. Um, mm-hmm. Effectively was given a way out here by by Mallory, and I, I just yeah. kind of really liked it. I, I think we kind of got a little precursor towards it between Mallory and Vogelbaum, actually, mm-hmm. because... Mother's Milk, Mallory, they they sort of turn up at Jonah Vogelbaum's um, massive mansion. Mm-hmm. And I was like going, oh, where are they going to? I didn't recognize it from season one. Yeah, And, um, you know, her and Vogelbaum are talking about, well, I'm out of it now. I'm staying out of it. And, and she's going, yeah, I thought I was, but you never really are. Uh, because they're trying to get him to, to come and fess up uh, in front of... Um, the senators uh, hearing as well but they're they're not as say persuasive shall we say as uh billy butcher is later on mm-hmm. uh with with his strong arming but um you know on on the on the way out um yeah she gives uh mother's milk this way out um you know fly him and his wife and daughter off to uh, another country uh, but i kind of just like the the way that you know when you go, it's about letting go. Um, you don't get any justice yeah. for your your father for anything like that. It's just an out, and you you can only take that out if you're willing to just let it all go, mm-hmm. release the the revenge, the 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 justice, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you're never going to be able to. And 
yeah, I just thought this was really good because yeah, he's we we forget Mother's Milk has has a kid yeah. and and a wife still. Uh, you know, certainly compared to Frenchie and Billy Butcher, he's a little more tied in yeah. here. Um, so yeah. I just thought that was kind of a really interesting conversation between the two of them. Definitely. It's, it's something you don't get to see very often, isn't it? In, in movies and TV shows, when they go to convince the star witness, it's usually uh, they'll do another, you know, they, they get challenged on it and then they just do another uh, quick discussion and then the star witness goes, oh, actually, I totally understand, you know. But uh, but obviously the conversation here uh, between Vogelbaum and Mallory, uh, it's an important one because Mallory did give up. She stepped away. She retired. She she stepped out of this so if there was anybody that you're going to convince that their decision that they already made was right it was going to be Mallory right so but I love that she tries to convince MM at least um to try and 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 go on with his family everybody else is kind of doesn't have any family we hear that a couple of times even in this episode nobody else really wants wants to give up this and go back to the safety of their family well they've they've got like fathers and mothers but not not their own uh family yeah. yeah but they don't really seem to like them no, very much not really <laughs> except <laughs> not for Frenchie. at all Frenchie does talk about his mom in this episode and says that she used to cook with him and he does have a lot of love for his mother so uh, everybody had their had their family moment in here also have to say absolutely loved seeing john doman back in this episode yeah, yeah me too love john doman we covered him on gotham when he was on that playing cameron falcone for uh, for three seasons of that show loved him in there he was fantastic in the wire loved him in that show and always followed the stuff that he's done so it's great to see him back in the boys season two didn't expect him back at all this season even though he was mentioned uh, by name early on in the season which is usually a sign that the character's coming back well that's it it was like the house i just didn't I didn't get. I was like, "Oh, this is a new person," mm-hmm. and because I'd forgotten his first name was Jonah, I was like, "Oh, new person, new person. Who's yep. this going to be?" This, yeah. um, I did also like the fact that when Billy Butcher turns up, he just drives over the lawn to get to the front door, <laughs> um, which was really <laughs> nice. And then it all, of course, gets a little dark uh, inside that mansion. Mm-hmm. Really, um, I just thought it was. Um, so good i mean because as well you know we hear about his sas training sort of earlier mm-hmm. um and it, it's just the the threat over fine bone china and a cup of tea which he then slurps <laughs> yeah. um it's just so so good uh, but basically Vogelbaum, if you don't testify with us you think you're out but you won't be because mm-hmm. it won't be vault that comes after uh you and your family it will be me, and I'll start with that nice little lady through there because his his daughter's there looking after him, mm-hmm. um, and then I'll get your two sons and their family. Yeah. And so, you know, he starts sort of striking off the list who he's going to go for. Yeah. And, uh, of course, yeah, Vogelbaum is uh, persuaded. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the strong-arm technique is, uh, is sometimes... Uh, very effective. Well, I think the thing is with Billy Butcher, you absolutely know he means it as well. So, um, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's what's what's the most imminent threat here? Is it that Vought will go, go after my family sometime in the future, or that Billy Butcher will walk into the next room and start his his moment of revenge on my daughter in the other room right now? That's basically the choice that he has, you know. And it it really cements. Carl Urban as this character Mm -hmm. where he was able there as a prim and proper British man (laughs) drinking the cup of tea. Uh What what does he call it? He doesn't even call it a cup of tea. Cup of cha. Cup of cha. Cup of cha. He goes a cup of cha. Haven't had one in ages and he's just sitting there with this just sadistic smile. Yeah. But it's, it's a perfectly normal good smile but just on him in the leather, in the Hawaiian shirt, yep. looking at Vogelbaum, and you're just like, that is probably the, the scariest thing you could ever see just staring back at you after they've said that he will go to town on your family. Definitely. And, like, do ten times worse than the soups. I wondered if he was going to dunk a biscuit as well, just for, for real, <laughs> just kind, kind of, of menacing biscuit dunk. dunking um, that he was going <laughs> to do um, in, in the tea. He could pull it off, definitely. But I, I think as well, the other thing I, I liked about this is I think he sees parallels with Vogelbaum um, uh, and how he treated Homelander and brought him up with his own father and that's what really then kind of um cements this sort of 
no tolerance all in approach in terms of you know help me or i'll kill all your family yeah um, and I thought that was kind of interesting yeah. as well. I thought it was very, and it works. Yeah, I thought, thought it was a very interesting uh, piece of information that we got about Homelander that he was a normal, lovable yeah. child up until he was six or seven. And I think the actual words that Vogelbaum says was, "And then I went to work on him." You know, um, he was pushing him to become this brutal person that that Homelander became. Um, that is the. The work that Vogelbaum did was to turn him into this hardened super hero yeah but homelander actually didn't want person. it exactly. he, you know he, he and was ultimately forced um yeah. and and you get that sense as well you can see it in billy butcher's eyes you know as vogelbaum is saying this mm-hmm. just um you know that connection as we've just seen uh then earlier uh with billy butcher and his own dad exactly speaking of which that's my protagonist moment for the episode as well billy meeting up with his mom and dad fly my pretty fly <laughs> with it nice setup job definitely um you know it was an interesting kind of uh, moment that we had we had um mentioned a few episodes ago when he, when billy was talking to his aunt uh, she was saying that his parents were on their on their way over Billy's mom gives him a call saying uh, that his dad has died. Uh, can he come over and comfort her because the father's died? You know, was there any doubt that his father was actually alive there? You know, it, it would seem massively coincidental that his father died on the flight over from the UK that Billy knew was happening, basically. So uh, I, I thought anyway. Uh, but we do see the appearance of Billy's dad, played by John Noble. Uh, genuinely Woo-hoo! the yeah. worst father in all of cinema and TV. <laughs> Absolutely. He was, the, uh, he was Denethor, as John mentioned, in Lord of the Rings, a terrible father who uh, tried to set his own son alight. Um, <laughs> he was the uh, the father from Fringe. Um, yep. Father-son relationship there, definitely not a good relationship at all. Um, nope. So he's the man to call when you need an evil a-hole on your team uh, as a father yep. character. Um, definitely. He's great in here, but... It's such an interesting, again, a very Kripke thing, I think, uh, when you see issues with fathers and sons. You know, that was one of the main uh, kind of running themes throughout the first five seasons of Supernatural. You know, fathers who treat their children poorly poorly to bring them up (laughs) into being strong people, I suppose, is this attitude. And as John mentioned, yeah, there's definitely a, a line there where you can see that maybe... Vogelbaum did the same thing to Homelander, and that's why Billy has no tolerance for him. So, uh, But it is a great discussion between the two, because you, I, I was expecting anyway, I was expecting that this character would be going, I'm really sorry for the way I treated you. But no, he keeps pushing this idea that yeah. Lenny was soft. Lenny died because his father didn't treat Lenny the same way that he treated Billy, um, that, that Lenny couldn't take it. And it's all Billy's fault that Lenny killed himself. We hear here it's slightly different origin story. Chris talked about it in Chris's Corner a couple of episodes ago. Uh, Lenny, his brother, was actually just killed by a bus uh, in the comic books. In the show here, we find out that Lenny killed himself. He shot himself. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and that was seems to have been the, one of the catalysts that made Billy go join the SAS, um, that he couldn't protect his brother. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, so Exactly. Or he didn't want to. I was very much expecting that encounter with his father to end with Billy throwing him off the balcony. I, I, me Anybody too. Else? I did yeah, kind well, of Literally, <laughs> until the mother turned up, I'm like, this is not going to end well. This is going like, to end. This is an additional reason. And I was expecting to see Vought's fingerprints on it and uh, like literally like a sniper because they were out on the balcony, a sniper. Oh, okay. Kind of like, I was expecting like this was a full setup. Oh, right. No, I, I literally just thought it was going to be Billy picking up his old father and throwing him over the balcony. I thought that was it. Like, he's going to die anyway in a couple of months' time. Billy well, just going, don't really care about this man. <laughs> well, I think as well with, with Black Noir kind of creeping around in the last few episodes, mm. um, I just was there going, okay, where's Black Noir? I, I kind of thought it was going to be one of the two things, either Billy Butcher rather than Put it, putting his dad up against the the patio window, I thought it was just going to chuck him off. Yeah. And certainly, when you learn what his mum thinks of her own husband mm-hmm. uh, later on, uh, then she probably wouldn't have been too miffed by it. But also, um, that or yeah, he was just going to get taken out by um, a a black noir who's creeping around, right. uh, as he has done as well earlier in this episode. Because Black Noir does like to creep. He mm. does. Yeah. So I will say just um, 
I, I was slightly taken out of it. Nothing to do with the performance or the storyline. It's just the, the actor himself, John Noble. I'm so used to seeing him as an American, especially for Fringe, which was what, seven, eight seasons? Yep. Yeah. Um, plus the few others. He always just plays the more, um, kind of, well to do American so it's a very I'm so used to that right. and then seeing him have this very much almost London Bristol kind of amalgam English accent uh-huh. I that just, really I is an like, amalgam of English accent it is that's, it really was because it was just like no if you listen to it like he just had emphasis where it shouldn't have had an emphasis yeah, yeah. they've gone obviously got him a dialect coach uh, or he probably would have as an actor. He went dialect coach. The, he was like, okay, he's UK based. Where? Because they haven't set where Billy is in this one. Mm. Um, they haven't given us where Billy is from. Yeah, in the he, UK. they just said just the his, reason why he British. has an odd accent is because he travels a lot. Because uh, I agree exactly. with you, there are definitely moments when you know it's the same dialect coach that they've given to Carl Urban because. Uh, weirdly, John Noble also has a little bit of an Australian accent, much like Carl exactly. Williams See, does. that was the bit. So but it's fine. it just it was fine, and it, like it was a great scene. It, it gave us a bit more clarity on the the the, the story history of Billy, mm-hmm. and it was fast. It was just there was the odd line or word that I was just like, <laughs> it was. Ba- it's basically like when Brad Pitt did that terrible. Um, tra- Irish traveler accent in Snatch. Whoa. Where he's like, Do you want to buy a dog? And it, it was just so. It was basically my big fat gypsy's wedding. He's gone and listened to a couple of people <laughs> and went, Yeah, sure, I can, I can pass it off. Wow. Now, I'm pretty sure when it, like English actors trying to do American accents yeah. or so, you'll be like, He's, he's Louisiana and he's New Orleans and he's got a bit of like. Georgia, and he's got a bit of New York in there. Yeah. Like, it's just this hodgepodge. Well, they always I say British actors doing American accents do an, an American accent, whereas there are 50 different American accents. <laughs> so they just yes. pick one <laughs> and go with it. Uh, I'm amazed you've said that, Chris. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody complain about the Snatch accent that Brad Pitt did, because that was his apology accent. He did that accent specifically <laughs> as an apology for his work on Devil's Own, where he sounded like, well, he was supposed to be an IRA man uh, in America, who sounded like he'd never left America, despite the fact he was supposed to be from Ireland <laughs> and flown over by plane the same day or something like that. So, uh, yeah, that was supposed to be his, his apology accent. Uh, there's a few actors uh, that possibly well, need to do that. But yeah. anyway, I did love the resolution to this story with Billy and his dad, that his mom actually does hate <laughs> his father, stays with him because he's going to be dead in a few months anyway. She just thought bringing the two of them together might let Billy let go of the hatred he had of his father and just move on because it's not worth it. He's going to be gone in a few few months, basically. So <laughs> that was I do hilarious. Like that. Yeah. And I must say, once again, just for our wonderful boys and girls, our listeners uh, to this podcast, it is so difficult talking about anything that happens with Billy Butcher, especially in this episode, because everybody around him is using the C word, which is absolutely impossible yeah. for us to use on this podcast. Everybody, you know, his aunt did it a couple of weeks ago. We had the uh, the the senator who was talking to Billy. That's their first introduction to each other. His mom is using it. His dad's using it. Everybody. So I can't. There's there's so few quotes that I can pull from these episodes. That's it. It so. is see you next Tuesday Definitely. to the max in this yeah. episode. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you talk about, say, the resolution, I love this because it did the exact opposite of what the mum wanted. The mum wanted Billy to stop beating himself up and being so violent mm-hmm. because of what happened to poor Lenny. In actual fact, it's made Billy resolute that he can be the biggest a-hole yeah. and be worse. And that's what happens. We see when he goes to Vogelbaum, like... He's actually leaning into being yeah. the biggest see you next Tuesday. Yeah. Like, it's just, I, it was just, I was expecting, again, I talk about this a lot. When I think they're going to zig, they zag. <laughs> Be, and it's great writing. That's what you love it's from this. Because you're like, yes. oh, I did not expect that. Yeah. You didn't do what I expected you. But I, th- yeah. I think he's always been a see you next Tuesday, though. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that, yeah, yeah. We've all, we've said that from the start the way yeah. he treats the people around him to get yeah. what he wants rather than what 
is important for everybody else. The, the way he makes yes. everybody leave everything behind, as long as it fits into Billy's plan, it's the right plan. So, okay, so, you're saying yeah. it, it's dialed up to eleven though now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Plan exactly. Cool. Definitely. Exactly. So that was it for uh, for our protagonist moments for the episode. That's me closing those woods out. Chris, you want to take us on with your antagonist, your seven moment from the episode? What's the one that struck you or blew your mind? Well, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> it's almost like you could see what I had written. It might be. Uh, I'm going to say Crisis in the Court. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to try and get a DC, DC reference, Crisis and Infinite nice. Earths, uh, Final Crisis, yeah. all that. I got Crisis in the Court. Nice, nice. Uh, because this really is, um, this was not what I was expecting. Uh-huh. This is, we get them, like, they do get to court. They get Vogelbaum in there. You've got all of the seven there. Yeah. Well, you've yeah. got well, you've got a majority of the seven in there. <laughs> yeah. You've got Vic the Veep or uh, uh, Victoria Newman, mm-hmm. you who's about to literally kind of break the Vault America piece down. You you literally have Edgar the 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 PR agent. You had everyone in that room. And things start popping up. Absolutely. Like, I love that introduction when Newman is telling everybody in the room, this is what's going to happen right here. We're going to take down the company because we have the one person that knows everything about them. He's going to tell you exactly what this company did. And you see the reaction as Vogelbaum's name is announced to the court. You see Homelander freaking out because he knows exactly yeah. what's going to happen yeah. here. And then the yeah. heads start a popping. <laughs> And so the interesting part, and the only reason I really wanted to bring this as my kind of my antagonist moment is it looks from like the way that Homelander and Stormfront are reacting. Mm-hmm. This doesn't seem like their plan. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what like, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Like they 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 are as shocked now. Stormfront is a great actress. Yeah. We know that she's able to slip in and out of a German accent. She is able to mask, uh, well, like no, yourself. German, huh? Yes, exactly. Uh, she slipped in her German accent in the uh, when she gave her origin. Remember? Okay. Um, she kind of had that. She started talking slightly in German. Right. right. Um, <laughs> I don't remember that, but uh, okay, if, okay, if well, you say head, if you, you say enough. so, I, then I, I I'm willing to accept that. She correctly pronounced a few German words, I think. Is, is yes, I think that was probably <laughs> okay, it. that was grand. more yeah. correct pronunciation. Um, but they are shocked by this, and that's the very interesting part. Yeah, that this doesn't seem to be part of their plan. I think their plan with this whole trial piece was just essentially get like. It was going to be nothing, really. It was, they had got Starlight. She was the traitor. They were going to use social media. We see them radicalizing a lot of other Americans. We see a lot of types of things like that. And this was just going to be a blip, as she calls it. Yeah. Uh, pre In previous episodes. The fact that everything starts popping off, mm-hmm. literally, I'm like, yeah. this sets up a very interesting place. Now, where... And we talked about it at the very opening of this. Uh, in previous episodes, I had surmised that the person who had killed Rainer was the soup that was in, as I call it, Shady Acres, uh, Cindy, who had literally exploded a guard. Mm-hmm. And then in that, at the end of that episode, we do see her hitchhiking away. Exactly. And I was like, interesting. What? Where are they going to go with that? I thought that was maybe setting it up for season three, that mm-hmm. there was a load of escaped the crazy soups that... The boys would need to hunt down. Yeah. I thought that in my, I was yeah. kind of where they might be going with that, and we kind of agreed. The fact that this has happened, and we see multiple explosions of a lot of people, mm-hmm. potentially both sides. I'm like, okay, maybe this is her. Yeah, this is her, like going rogue, if you will. Um, but the fact that Vogelbaum is kind of before he even gets a few words out i'm like maybe not this is edgar's doing maybe yeah uh, or there's more to it maybe. i just thought it was really interesting it sets us up in a nice place yeah. definitely it, it's all a little unknown for sure because yeah mm. as you're saying you see homelander queen mave and stormfront almost doing an avengers back to back in the courtroom yeah. you ashley is on the floor um trying to protect herself all that kind of stuff so 
it's as you say it, that's really really cool that they aren't the ones involved in this mm-hmm. um it's probably edgar i i feel um out of all of them okay. and i'm not ruling cindy out but i suppose it's it'll be interesting to know what her motivation is because i kind of have a feeling why would she be protecting vort given what they've done to her unless she was more than happy to do that but then i don't understand why she was fleeing and stormfront you know took her down it it it, it feels like she's not a part of vort unless She's maybe reporting directly to Edgar. I, I just don't know. Okay. I, I want to see her motivation because I feel from what we've seen that she would be attacking Vought, I not people trying to take yeah. down Vought. I think but, she's on the warpath. And remember, Vogelbaum was Vought up until he retired. That's true. He, that's uh, true. He as absolutely well. was Vought. So uh, I, I was I was more intrigued by you know what did she need to be in the room? Is she hidden in the room somewhere wearing a wig or a hat or something? Uh, or is she watching this on TV from a distance and just picking them off? Uh, you know, watching the coverage that's on there. Um, also, it's not just Vogelbaum and some random people in there. We also see Shockwave, A Train's replacement, losing his head yep. in here as well. So uh, so there was a suggestion that A Train uh, might be able to go back to the Seven uh, in a couple of weeks' time after a meeting that has been planned. <sighs> Is this possibly, you know, how they created a hole for oh, him? Oh, and, and the, the Church seven? of the Collective. Yeah. It's the, actually, oh, wow. Did they, did they create his position? I did not connect that. <laughs> that. That's just something that popped into my head when I, when I saw uh, Shockwave's head pop. <laughs> so. Yeah, because uh, in the in a scene uh, in this episode, we do see the head of the Collective say that he is meeting Edgar later exactly. and is sure he can get stuff that is interesting yeah, yeah. that they pretend to have other soups working for maybe it's never been Cindy mm-hmm. maybe maybe it's the the collective doing the dirty anyway there you go yeah. really interesting yeah. it sets us up in a nice place yeah, Absolutely. definitely well the one thing I also was thinking about with Cindy was and I know it's a very similar power don't get me wrong but when Cindy was exploding people she was exploding them entirely um mm. and she's own uh, what it seems like is these people have their powers and they've been using them a bit but this was very targeted. Every single person yeah. lost their heads, uh, very specifically lost their heads. So uh, so I don't know. Uh, she seemed to just explode everybody around her when she wanted to. Uh, this seemed very targeted. So that's why, I, that's why I had a question over Cindy. Could it be the crazy psychiatrist from the collective? Could that be. Because, be really yeah, it blows your mind. She blows your mind. <laughs> <laughs> was that the only reason? <laughs> Gentlemen, so that is it. Crisis in the courts. There you go. Uh, I'm going to swiftly move it over. Mr. Harrison. Why, thank you, um, darling. What is your antagonist moment? What is your seven moment? It is Black Noir. Isn't that invincible after all? Um, it's just a short okay. point, but I just loved it when Queen Maeve um, came in to help um, Starlight. She was absolutely getting fl- uh, flung around the, the conference room by, by Black Noir after she's escaped. Uh, and I was like, what is she stuffing into his mouth? I thought it was some kind of sedative or yeah. just trying to gag him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was even contemplating that uh, she might just snap his neck or something. But um, no, not allergy to the rescue or <laughs> peanut power, uh, fellow boys and girls. Yes, uh, Black Noir has a nut allergy and <laughs> he's just left sort of rocking and, and shaking as the allergy uh, spreads throughout. Um, and the really interesting thing after it is that Queen Maeve afterwards is just kind of like leaves him there. Yeah. And But she's not going to go with um, Starlight either. But I love that she helps out here, certainly because, you know, we, we saw her uh, earlier in the episode where Eleanor has left her. She's having um, breakup sex and uh, that one part where you know she just kind of pleads to ashley who comes in and sees this breakup sex Mm -hmm. and says oh you know she's freaking out because the narrative of her having a strong lesbian relationship um has just been blown wide apart Mm -hmm. with with uh, the guy lying next to to queen maeve It's but not um, even a woman. You were the number two uh, most favorite know, lesbian exactly. couple in America. Oh, um, God, Ashley. <laughs> and Queen Maeve just saying, you know, for once, Ashley, can you just be human? Mm. And she yeah. she kind of head, head down and apologizes as she walks out. But 
you know, we were talking about Queen Maeve uh, maybe teaming up with Starlight. We didn't get it here, but she's certainly... There is no love lost now with Vought whatsoever. Eleanor has gone. Homelander really hasn't got her back anymore. Mm -hmm. It is uh, making her life miserable, as is Vought with the, the, the whole pushing of her lesbian relationship. And Eleanor has also, as I said, has left now. So, mm -hmm. um, but I just like that it was, um, this, this whole thing with Queen Maeve. And I mean, we kind of, at last, even though it was just a dining room table, we did see her kind of freak out and fling the dining room table mm -hmm. across um, her apartment. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was good to get a bit of that emotion. It feels like it's been pent up with Queen Maeve Absolutely. for a number of episodes. Um, yeah. And of course, it was an almond joy mm -hmm. that was put in there. Yeah, so. I know Huey called it one of the top three worst uh, candy bars <laughs> ever created, but I didn't think it would kill someone. Uh, remember, was, she, she didn't just leave Black Noir behind after stuffing the almond joy in his mouth. He was taking out his insulin pen and she kicked it out of his hand as well. So um, so has that killed him? Well, Is he definitely ah. dead? <laughs> Is that the end of Black Noir? Well, um, probably I, not, but having said that, Vault security again, given that all the sprinkler system went off mm -hmm. with lamplighter going up in flames, no one came very quickly. Nope. I suppose the whole thing is that you need to get out of the building. Exactly. But that's I kind of the... felt like there would be yeah, that, something. That's what we see with the security guard who's supposed to be uh, standing outside Starlight's room. You hear the you hear the alarm's gone off with a fire, and he's like, "All right, I'm out of here," and just runs away. <laughs> I loved seeing fully powered Starlight that moment when she gets her powers back because she'd been uh, kind of cowed in the room um unable to use her powers because it's a super, a super proof room. Um And as she gets them back, you see the eyes light up and she just blows the door out of the way. That's, it's cool yeah. seeing Starlight use her powers that way. It's deadly. Uh, and the battle again with, with Black Noir, I thought was a really good fight mm. uh, between the two of them because she's, you know, soup on soup action, always good to watch. I know Lamplighter would probably say that because uh, that seemed to be what all he was doing for most of the episode. <laughs> I will very quickly call out, we got to see Black Noir's face. Mm -hmm. Yes. He looks uh, Wade Wilson-esque, Deadpool-esque. Yep. He looks either scarred or burned or something. It's certainly very damaged, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Which is very interesting. Absolutely. Um, very interesting yeah. because it means they are going completely the opposite direction of... Uh, the comic books again here for it. Yeah, here for it. Yeah, it, they might as well take a take a shot at Deadpool. Um, that's uh, they, they might as well uh, include that in the show. Yeah, uh, doesn't look like Nathan Mitchell, uh, the actor who plays him. I know a lot of people have seen Nathan Mitchell doing uh, doing interviews, and I've heard a lot of people wishing that he'd take off the mask more often. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, no, no, so no, no, that is, is not. Um, they're going with the burnt that Deadpool is not, face. But no, it was definitely cool. Yeah. Derek, sorry, John, is that the end it of your? Certainly is. Peanut power. Excellent. Oh. Peanut power all the way. <laughs> Terrico, what is your point? For my antagonist moment, um, I'm just going to talk about the family uh, again. It's, it seems to be all about family for me uh, this episode. Um, uh, Homeland, Homelander and Stormfront and Ryan makes three. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think this is uh, just an interesting development for uh, these characters. You know, it's kind of always been a thing with Homelander if he wants something he takes it is pretty much his his kind of mode uh, all the way through the show so he has that moment with Stormfront where she has a memory of her child because uh, her child used to be a baby she sees a baby in uh, in the crowd and Homelander kind of gets this idea going oh I can show you something that uh, you might you might be interested in uh, and they take a little flight out to Becca and Ryan's house um, and convince Ryan to come and join um, their family by putting Becca at odds, basically. They they take Ryan, uh, tell him all about the world outside, the compound that he's been living in for all of his life. They talk to him about things that he couldn't even know about, you know, games that he couldn't possibly play or games that, that his mom could never show him because it shows the outside world. Um, they they work on him over and over again. And then while her mom, while Becca's making dinner for the, for a lot of them, they take him on a trip up in the sky to show him that he's living in a compound and that his mom has been lying to him uh, the whole time. So, um this is a this is a really uh, tough situation uh, for for Becca. Obviously, she's been trying to protect Ryan so much for these whatever it is eight or nine years that the, that she's been away, um, seven or eight years maybe uh, at this stage. But they're gone now, um, so she has no purpose effectively. He's realised that 
this whole compound that was there was the Truman Show all built around Ryan, hiding Ryan yeah. from the world and hide, hiding Ryan's ability to see what the world is like, effectively. So uh, so yeah. it's a very attractive proposition that's there from Homelander and, and Stormfront. But now they have their evil, blonde-haired, blue-eyed child. Uh, well, future evil, <laughs> blonde-haired, blue-eyed child. Uh in tow. Well, I suspect that they did leave out the fact that Homelander raped his mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and so maybe there is a chance before they really get their claws into him that, uh, if that truth outs, um, then yeah, he, he, he kind of goes against them. Um, mm-hmm. because yeah, if, if there was nothing more that kind of brought a little bit of sick into my mouth, it was the idea of maternal Stormfront. Um, yep. oh my goodness. Absolutely. Like, that is the last person, um, you want to ha- get your, the, their fangs into your kid. Mm. Oh my goodness. It just, it, it was frightening. Um, and even just that, you know, her and Homelander that, just this take, take, take. Yeah. Um, yeah. Homelander is his kid. I get it. And, yeah. and so on to, to some extent, but Stormfront there really, um, you know, you could just imagine if Becca thinking to herself, if I was a soup, I would come over and rip your head off. Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was so interesting to see Becca's speech to Homelander. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially going but like it's not going to happen you like the difference is he has me blah 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 mm-hmm. I, and I did think that was the end of it really? I did think that like that's the way I was like okay she got through to him it's all gonna go well yeah. what I enjoy about this potentially is she's gonna go try and fight Butcher now mm-hmm. maybe yeah and like if she basically if she asks Go kill Homelander and get back my son. Mm-hmm. That re- renews Butcher's mission. Yeah, he certainly doesn't need any. Because anything he, other his, than his yeah, initial mission was kill Homelander because he killed Becca. Mm-hmm. Becca's alive. Becca doesn't want to go with him because Ryan, and he he lost his mission to a degree. Now this renews it. Exactly. Um, so it's it, again definitely interestingly sets up season three definitely yeah. definitely um any other outstanding moments from the episode chris what uh what else do you have to talk about from the episode um eagle the archer likes to go hunting <laughs> mm, that was an interesting one wasn't uh, it yeah. i thought this was re- uh, this is just a silly it was a passing joke bit that eagle the archer is no longer as part of the collective mm. um essentially he told them he wanted to leave and they basically leaked this video of him with his partner, um, essentially dressed up as a deer yeah. who he hunts, mm. uh, which was <laughs> fantastic. With his spear. I just thought that was, it was, it, that was funny. But then how, again, this is, we, we, we know this is a direct rip at, uh, Scientology, uh-huh. uh, obviously just based on everything they've said and done, yep. uh, and the, the backstory of this. But the way that they, um, uh, th- this mimics the other people and, um, what has happened to real life celebrities who have left Scientology, yep. leaking of tapes. But the terminology, uh, like, it's reminiscent of what they say. Um, it was just, I just found it, like, humorous in terms of that scene, mm-hmm. but very nuanced in terms of how they, they, wrote the rest of it around that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and I'm sure there's also references here to many cults that have been around that have done yes. something very similar. Uh, I like the fact they brought in uh, A-Train to, um, to kind of react to this story because it seems like the Deep was just told... You know, Eagle the Archer, it's like, yeah, a yeah, great friend of mine. He's out now. You're not allowed to talk to him again. Oh, yeah, I never really liked him. <laughs> I know. Uh, the yeah. Deep. <laughs> oh, or, or as man. you see A-Train re- hearing this story and kind of going, hang on a second, there's something weird about this. Do you not think it's weird yeah. 
uh, deep and he's like no no never really my friend <laughs> kind of, <you> know. <laughs> yeah. uh, also just quickly while I'm on the deep uh, I love Chase Crawford's reaction when they're watching uh, the exploding <laughs> heads in the courtroom for some reason the deep checks his head to see if it's still on his body <laughs> yeah. it's, it's so yeah. odd it's such an odd it's reaction so good. but uh, I'm sure he's just uh, kind of empathetic to the fact that loads of people that he's seeing on screen are losing their heads but it's a weird one he just looks like he's touching his head to see if it's still there um, but that's the deep <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. Chase Crawford amazingly plays that kind of surfer, kind of the surfer dude, mm-hmm. slightly silly, dumb. Because, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's empathetic. Yeah. He literally is checking to make sure his head's not going to explode. Exactly. And it's, it's interesting just as well. Like Chase Crawford, you know, as the actor in this show, he's the one that spends the least amount of time with any of the ra- the major cast of the show. He's only had that first episode, I think, and then he got sent off on his own to this other town. So now he has a bit of time with A-Train. At least there's a little bit of kind of moments with one of the other members of the main cast. But he's very much been on his own, on his own yeah. journey for the last season and a half. So, uh, so yeah, really good fun uh, moments in there. Um, John, your outstanding moment for the episode? I, I suppose it's just that um, first bookend yes. um, right at the start. It's the murder of the shopkeeper. And yeah. I, I think, you know, like to your point, Chris, um, the the mix in the boys from some really serious um treatment of of current um issues mm-hmm. problems to yeah the deep checking whether his head's still there even though he's watching yeah. um the exploding heads on TV mm-hmm. um and, and and it's it's this murder of the shopkeeper and I, I suppose more importantly it's it's that bombardment of fear, um, negative, yeah. fake news um, in some respects to the population, that continual bombardment where, you know, after a time, it just becomes trigger words to get people yeah. all gammony and, and all really, um, you know, red faced. Uh, like a big jointed gammon, um, or you know, just wound up. And in yeah. this case, the the and you you can see it, you know, the 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 kid in his bedroom just not knowing what to do. And in the end, it's played out with violence as he thinks the shopkeeper is a soup. Um, and when he looks over uh, after he shot him in the in the head. Um, that it, he's not coming back from this. Mm-hmm. He has just killed someone. Uh, and it's that, that leading to suspicion of other people and fear. Um, and I think the really interesting thing here as well on it is that, you know, the first thing we see are Stormfront and, and Homelander, uh, making more propaganda out of it. Yep. Uh, we've given money to this charity. But they, along with the media outlets, along with the the narrative, I suppose, coming from Vought, mm. are whipping this up, uh, and you kind of get that really fake emotional response from Stormfront and Homelander uh, to the death of this shopkeeper. Yep. Um, and Those. I just thought, you know, it's it's really on point Absolutely. for the times that we live in. Those three um, little words really that we've is. heard so often over the last three or four years. Thoughts of Paris? Uh, let's yeah. move on and get back to our campaign that's going on here. You this know, is absolutely how so many of us have felt over the last four, five, six years, really. I'm sure you guys are the same as me. This is the constant bombardment from both sides of headlines or memes or just a set of words that's supposed to get you riled up on either side. I have friends now who used to be people that watched soap operas and reality TV shows who now watch CNN and Fox News like they watched reality TV shows. They talk about them the same way they used to talk about reality TV shows. They are so whipped up into a frenzy by the headlines that are out there that it, it's no wonder that people are getting more and more aggressive at each other on the internet yeah. because everybody's being whipped up by everything that they're seeing out there. And this is what they're, this is what they're doing. This is exactly what Homelander and Stormfront are doing. There's a reason why she's called Stormfront. It's not just because those are her powers. She's here to whip up a storm around her. And Homelander is using the exact type of phrases we've heard from another really weird yellow-haired person uh, over the last couple of years uh, to this audience that he has in front of him. This yeah. is this is again the show was done last last summer it was completely finished filming. Uh, there's nothing recent about this but it was all there plain to see for all of us for the last few years but it's not yeah. it's not just on one side this is absolutely and the very 
clear to put it in there. Uh, the senator that we have seen throughout the series, uh, this series, uh, Senator Newman, her words are in there in this uh, this guy, he's seeing yes, it, the news of her as well exactly. as Homeland and Stormfront. It's the montage of divisive, uh, polarizing uh, headlines. Exactly. You know, it's it's the immigrants, it's the terrorists, it's the corrupt politicians, yep. it, it's um, the the bad corporations. All of this that that kind of are being brought together into this soup. That um, you know, in this case, the you can't actually process within your own mind yeah. and it ends up being the only way you can do it is through raw or physical actions by mm-hmm. just shouting or sticking where you are or in this case with the the kid here and um, murdering the shopkeeper and okay. um, yeah it was just uh, yeah really it was some opening that's Absolutely. for sure and we know from season one, uh, the thing that they're all whipping up about, uh, what Homelander's trying to whip everybody up on their side about, is the international terrorists that are on the soup attack. Terrorists. The soup terrorists. The ones Homelander created at the end of season one. Uh, he's the, he's the oh, person sorry, responsible. Sorry, not soup terrorists. Super villains. Super villains, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But they're the ones he created uh, back at the end of season yeah. one. So yeah. he's, he's now whipping up everybody against them who haven't really done anything at all uh, throughout this season of the show, these super villains that he's blaming. There's There's been no terrorist attack by them at all, but he's whipping everybody up with this frenzy to go after the thing he yep. created, effectively, which was always yep. his mission. So he's he's achieving his mission with the help of Stormfront here as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, really interesting uh, moments in this episode and a really stark opening to the episode. Yeah, I it really was. Yeah. Yeah, radicalization to violent extremism through misinformation Mm -hmm. and through the use of uh, quote unquote fake news, um, through uh, sensationalism in online short snippets, Mm -hmm. the the take the consumption um, of non or I should say biased and non non biased uh, media, be it all sides. Um, echo chambers through so social media yeah. that have been created in the positive and negative. Yeah. Um, there are positives to echo chambers sometimes. Only if you just can't hear the voices that you don't want to hear. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, it is a, a it's it's a twenty first century problem mm-hmm. that will become more than likely epidemical in uh, the years in twenty twenty one. It is something I just hate. What a lovely opening! Thought. This opening of this scene. The opening of this was so, I use the term shocking and mind blowing. I know, and that's actually not as a joke because I have not seen it so well visualized Mm -hmm. in an empathetic way. Because we do see this guy, we see his journey to radicalization. And that is something we never, you never see in 99% of any dramatic reincarnation recreations yeah. or dramatical shows you see the end product yeah. this shows you the actual transformation over time of a what is considered a normal guy who gets up reads his internet his news says goodbye to his mother goes to work stops in for a coffee goes home yeah. like that just normal and we see it over like stares longly at a girl as he walks by the car mm-hmm. uh but it's just that constant barrage Absolutely. so 24-hour news over and over and oh, over yeah. and over yeah. again well that's it i mean who needs 24-hour news i mean I, t- I i ask you yeah like there was there were days yes. even just after the war where uh where there wasn't enough news to fill up a 15-minute bulletin how the hell are we doing 24-hour yeah. news now but that's uh that's uh, beside, beside the point um it's a, it's a fantastic moment and we i'm really glad we talked about it at least in the, in the episode here, because uh, if it wasn't for our format, that probably would have been the top point that we talk about that opening of the episode. Yes. It's, a, it's a really great way that they've shown it on, on screen. Um, we've kind of talked through everything that uh, I wanted to talk about, so I don't really have a, a, a another outstanding moment from the episode. I do want to just reference the uh, the conversation between Frenchie and uh, and the female, finally back together again, Kamiko and, and, uh, and Serge. We have both of their names now as the uh, as the season goes on, um, but yeah, there's a, it's a nice little moment as they're uh, as they're watching over the senator's house. Um, 
with what looks like a massive rocket launcher. Yeah, it French. does, doesn't it? Yeah, it worked out. It was a, like I I thought for a second it was like just a sniper rifle or something. Well, I was expecting a sniper rifle, and then the camera pulls back, and it literally looks like he's about to send a rocket over yeah. at that crowd of people <laughs> if they attack. Is what it looks like. But but we do get you know they have made up. We saw that last episode, and now um, it looks like. Uh, Kimiko is going to teach him uh, the sign language. We're going to start with guns, as you always would between these two. So, yeah. you know, what, what do we normally talk about? Guns, right? Let's let, let's teach you guns first, uh, which I like. I really like that. Uh, and also, um, just a quick note, I suppose. Uh, I also liked uh, the reference to how weird Ryan actually is by being uh, safely secured into his mom's house. Is he's like any other kid? He's making YouTube videos uh, from his his Lego toys, but he's making the blind side. Uh, and he's, yeah. and he's, all, he's also made Dances with Wolves, the Lego video yeah. with his mom. Absolutely. Oh, odd. Uh, but I, I love it. You know, do you want to watch my Dances with Wolves Lego video in a moment? You know, oh, he's very creative. Clearly he's very, uh, he's very experienced. It looked, it looked exactly like the Lego movies, but um, very weird that he would, uh, that that's, those are the types of movies that he'd be making. But yes. they're, they're the ones that his mom loves. They're, they're his mom's favorites, I suppose. So kind of nice. Anybody else have any other notes for the episode? Nothing for me. Uh, John, anything from your side? Just the, the the title of the episode is Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker, which is that reference to uh, the old nursery rhyme. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the name of the 12th volume of the collected comics of the boys mm -hmm. as well. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, just yes. A, a little bit of background there. Yeah. Butcher um, Baker Candlestick Maker all out to sea. Is that right? Yes. Is that where we are in uh, episode seven of The Boys? We're all out to sea, I think. Yes. That makes way more sense in my head. And the dish ran away with the spoon. Yeah. No, definitely That's how it, it, exactly. my nursery I know, are, exactly. I um, but I think it's time to get onto a certain yogurty corner. Uh, it's not Muller. It's Chris's corner. <laughs> yeah. I do. I, I, I am very yogurty. You are um, in a white t-shirt. I am. Yes. I am. What have you got for us this week, Chris? So this one I was going to talk about Vogelbaum. Johan Vogelbaum. Not Jonah. Johan. Um, so I just want to quickly talk about the differences between this character, since he is so central and pivotal, or was pivotal, mm -hmm. <laughs> in this uh, episode. So I'll talk about, obviously, so... In this TV show, he's played by uh, John Daman. He's the CSO of Vaughn International. And essentially, he's the creator of Homelander. So, um, as we saw in season one, um, after he retired kind of um, from being uh, the CSO, he's visited by Homelander, and Homelander's able to kind of squeeze out of him that uh, the Becca um, has the baby, mm -hmm. and that's how we kind of end up where we end up. Um, he also claimed uh, he's confronted by Butcher and S Stillwell, and they're able to kind of say, um, essentially, that Homelander squeezed the truth out of him um, when we know it, actually he he's the one who paralyzed. Homelander is the one who par paralyzed Vogelbaum. Yes. Now... Vogelbaum is completely different in the comic books. So that's the character. That's where we are. We, he is, then he's been paralyzed. He's been living away from Vought, away from everything with his family in the TV show up until his death now. In the comic books, it's a lot different. Um, in the comic books, Johann Vogelbaum is actually the Jewish scientist, um, who is responsible for creating Compound V mm. for the Nazis. So, um, he, he took it and his, uh, he's the one who, um, took, sorry, he took the formula for Compound V and, uh, some samples along with Stormfront and brought them to United States as part of his deal to get across. Uh, he started working for Vought America, um, for Frederick Vought, another uh, a person who's come over from the, from Germany, um, and essentially they together start using it to create Compound V. Mallory, uh, and remember in the comic books it's Greg Mallory. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he essentially convinces um Johan to start working for the CIA. Mm, right, and this is where. In the comic books, and I think we briefly mentioned it, the boys start are injected with Compound mm -hmm. V 
in order to just temporarily boost their power, boost them to soup level strength and invulnerability and stuff, so they can take on soups one on one uh, without kind of getting their head squished. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's actually him who starts working with Mallory uh, and the boys way before Huey when they were still the Black Ops. Later on, uh, Mallory orders Butcher to kill and uh, kill Johan. Right. Butcher spares him um, and starts getting him and tells everyone he's dead and gets him to start working on a way to, he becomes a bit like their Frenchie. He becomes a way to exterminate anyone with compound V. Right. Very good. So ah, essentially okay. like this, anyone who has compound V, how can we kill them? Interestingly enough, <laughs> once this was figured out, Billy then kills you. Right. Right. Um, Kills him by his head. Yeah, no, goes pop. Another explosion. So there head. is there is uh, an interesting connection there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, very good. Chris. Um, so there you go. That is the Vogelbaum Johann Vogelbaum. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Chris. Uh, really good to have Chris's Corner back this yeah, week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one final Chris's mm-hmm. Corner next week on episode eight uh, of season two of The Boys. Uh, let us know what, if you have any uh, anything that we want to talk about in Chris's Corner uh, by emailing us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com, where all of our feedback comes to. Um, let's close out this episode of The Boys. Overall, John, what do you think of the episode? Yeah, really loved this episode. Um, I'm Give it four and a half crusty the lamplighters out of five. Um, I really did uh, enjoy it. Um, I think from the kind of pretty serious start, um, and it, it kind of descended into that lovely madness that the boys brings, uh, from Huey taking lamplighter on a tragic rescue mission ultimately, uh, for Starlight. Queen Maeve, again, more tragedy there, but help coming and saving the day uh, for for Starlight, who was getting choked out of it by Black Noir, um, with uh, the the peanut uh, the peanut rescue, mm-hmm. and then um, you know that that final scene as well with the exploding heads. Mm-hmm. It was just um, I, it reminded me of the Canadian show uh, where it's like. I, I, I'm squishing your head. I'm squishing your head. <laughs> um, with, uh, and, uh, it, it was just really, really good. And you're like, who is that? To what extent does Edgar know, uh, Stormfront, Homelander, Queen Maeve? It was all really, really good. And yeah, having John Doman back as old Vogelbaum, mm-hmm. uh, is, is really, um, it was really nice to see, Fact. even though yeah. it was for a, a short moment. So yeah, I had four and a half crusty the lamplighters out of five <laughs> from me. Nice one, John. Nice one. What do you think, Chris? Um, absolutely enjoyed it immensely. Mm-hmm. Pretty much for all the same reasons John did. I am slightly concerned. We have one hour left mm-hmm. in this season of the boys. I do not think they're going to be able to wrap up everything no. as they, n- as neatly in a bow. Yep. Um, but as we have discussed uh, both on this podcast uh, and off air, there is a season three. Mm-hmm. We know it is coming. Um, so, yeah, it will be interesting to see where we stand 60 minutes from now. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I always like a show that has a, a cliffhanger at the end of a season. I think it's a, a fun way to close out your show, especially if we know that the next season's coming. I think we've had that problem before, Chris. We've had uh, had some shows that didn't get a following season that had a massive cliffhanger on them, like uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels, anyone? Um, ended with oh. massive cliff- cliffhangers on it and isn't getting a, a second season. So uh, we will never know what happens uh, with those characters in future, unfortunately. No, so. no. Oh. I, at least, yeah, as you say. We, we know what's happening, and fingers crossed it's 12 months from now, maybe? Maybe, maybe. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, if they have to have this much blood um, and this much CGI in the show to uh, to uh, protect people, uh, it, may, <laughs> it may take a little bit longer. Uh, thanks so much for that, guys. Um, let's get on to our feedback on episode six. Uh, first up, we had an email in from Will B on last week's episode. He said, hello, gentlemen. First time sending an email feedback because I couldn't quite fit it all on Twitter. Uh, favorite scene from episode six was I loved the car ride scene between Starlight and Butcher. Starlight doesn't seem like she's quite ready to accept everything that comes along with being all in with the boys, but is acknowledging she's changing by admitting that she doesn't feel the sympathy and regret anymore. Favorite line for the episode? Frenchie saying, don't be so closed minded in regards to MM coming to grips with the fact that he got choked out by a giant soup penis. <laughs> <laughs> don't be so closed minded. Excellent. Love it. Good old Frenchie. Uh, 
Well says, love the Frenchie backstory and the fact that it led to some form of healing between he and the female. In some ways, I'm relieved to see that Homelander has aligned himself with Stormfront, removing the tiny part of me that was rooting for him this season. Unless that is, he's double-crossing her? We shall see. I'm hoping that Cindy and the female will team up in the next couple of episodes. Looking forward to listening to the podcast later today. Thanks again, Will B. Thanks, Will. That's really good. Uh, really good thoughts there. Yeah, thanks so much, Will. Um, that's that's really uh, that's really nice of you. And I think, um, yeah, that would be awesome about Cindy and the female teaming up. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of feel that they would really uh, love to do that to get at Stormfront. Uh, you know, by their powers combined. Uh-huh. Um, and I, again, it, it that that kind of feeling just makes me wonder whether it's Cindy exploding these heads uh, or whether maybe it's a secret soup that Edgar has got stashed away somewhere. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, no, thanks for the, the feedback, Will. Cheers, Will. Appreciate mm-hmm. it. Uh, I'm right there with you with Don't Be So Close Minded. <laughs> it was one of the funniest bits. Yeah, excellent. And uh, looking back on it now, I'm still like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Over on Facebook, we got some feedback for episode six as well from Salim Kisler, who said, Iceman is pyro. (laughs) Yes, he is. Uh, What a fantastic episode. I have no idea how they're going to bring this to a conclusion in two more hours. I love the world building and getting Frenchie's backstory. Mm -hmm. His relationship with Sherry makes so much more sense now. Yeah. What an appearance by the love sausage. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I don't want to step on anything that Chris has for us on that uh-huh. subject. I had nothing. I'm so sorry, Celine. Well, nothing for the comics. Uh, yeah. That was definitely a big point from last week's episode. <laughs> yes, it was a big point, just not, not from the comics. Uh, the good guy roster seems to be growing. There's even some grudging respect between Starlight and Butcher. I do think we will see the boys start shooting up V, if not this season, then early mm-hmm. next. The seven may be two very soon mm-hmm. i am suspicious that Sorefront is playing homelander they are both sick in much very different ways mave is playing with fire no pun intended but why didn't elaine just use her own phone <laughs> the other thing i'm surprised by was frenchy shooting that guard i don't think a train will join the church but i'm curious to see where that goes thank you so much Salim. uh yeah th- that did actually kind of make me go why didn't elaine use phone and then i'm like oh yeah there's like there's takeaway apps that I have on mine because they count on mine uh-huh. that just kind of like m- my wife will come up to me and go, wait, can can you just order this? And I'm like, here, just take it. Exactly, exactly. It's easier. They're very close. Uh, yeah, she can, do, she can use her phone. Yeah, thanks, Salim. And of course, yeah, Chris didn't manage to provide us with any love sausage uh, for his corner uh, <laughs> uh, last week. Or may- maybe he could have done, but it would have been a different comic. Oh, God. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That's a very different comic. We also got some feedback from Trevor Green, who replied to Salim's uh, message going, the way that Maeve and Elaine scene ended came across as a misdirect to me. Elena's reaction to the video could be interpreted as horrified, mm-hmm. but for some other reason, it gave me the impression that Elena could be a plant by Vought to keep tabs on Maeve. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Trevor. And wow. Well, we saw how it played out this episode. You, you're absolutely right, Trevor. That was a horrified look on Alina's face. Um, she was kind of going, how do I play this now? I've seen the power of Maeve and it's terrifying to me. I really love that conversation in this episode. You mentioned a bit of it uh, earlier on, John, but I really love the reaction from her kind of going, I know how strong you are now because if that was me, I wouldn't possibly be able to continue living my life doing the kinds of things that Homelander is making you do. Yeah. Uh, you know, she says she wakes up screaming every night after seeing this a video of the kid dying on the plane. So, um, so yeah. So I don't think she was a plant to vote. I think it was just, as you say, it played out that she was horrified by seeing the things that uh, that happened from Maeve. We kind of also see in this episode, uh, Vaught didn't want the relationship to end. Vaught, Vaught wanted both of them together to live the life as this uh, number two uh, lesbian couple in America. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, who's number one? Is it? Um, it's supposed to be. Alan? It's Alan P- Portia de Rossa. That's the, uh, that's, that, they had referenced that in a previous episode as well. Oh, so, that was yeah. it. Yeah, it was Portia de Rossa. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, yes. The power couple. Yeah, we also got some feedback from uh, Bob Phillips. What an episode. Where are we going? Can Cindy make cinders of the seven? Nice. Will they, resplendent in ball gown and with mouse-turned footmen, crashing the annual shareholders meeting of Vought. Why is Frenchie called Serge? 
were Cherie, Jay, and Serge a throuple? Mm. Did we know Starlight was a channel of energy rather than a generator before today? How can cauterizing the abdominal wall save someone from splenic rupture and probably massive mesenteric arterial lacerations? Nice. Now we've had anime-inspired tentacle sex and more head-popping pleasure. What niche are unexplored? <laughs> well, thank you, Bob, uh, for that. And I, should I say Dr. Bob Phillips? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, probably uh, cauterizing the wound wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't save uh, poor old Huey uh, much. But, uh, well... He, he, it's TV magic, it's TV magic, yeah. exactly. And he, I suppose yes. he was still bleeding today, so it, it's not been all good for Huey. Yeah, um, they what, did an operation when they got him to hospital. This was that was just to just to help him get to the hospital. Is what was well, happening there? But yeah. again, you're you're definitely right. Bob. I would <laughs> say would, so. Wouldn't have helped too much. Um, I think as well. Yeah, what niches are going to be explored? Um, I dread. Don't, go there. Don't ask the question. No, exactly. <laughs> I dread to think. Um, uh, what niches are going to get explored? Well, in fairness, they gave us like six or seven in this episode because we had all the videos that uh, that uh, Lamplighter was watching, which explored a multitude of other possible yeah, n- porn outlets. N- for, niches, uh, for this show. crevices, you name it, yeah. uh, it was explored. We also saw um, Eagle the Archers. We did, yep. Uh, so I'm just like, don't ask the question. They're going to, like, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there that don't, uh, just don't. But thank you so much, Dr. Bob. Absolutely. One of the things that uh, that was just on the after show, the, the official uh, after show on, on Amazon Prime, that had the costume designer on after last week's episode, and she made reference to the fact that when Chase Crawford was getting his first costume fitting, he, got, he was wearing a pair of green underwear and put on the top of the costume and was about to walk out of the costume fitting thinking that was what his entire costume was was uh, was him in a pair of green underwear and this top and this is what they used in the episode uh, here where they had the porn video of the deep they had that costume as the deep's costume so she referenced that it was going to be seen in an upcoming episode so uh, a nice little nice little callback a nice little behind the scenes excellent there. stuff excellent. yeah thanks so much for that Dr. Bob uh, Chris Aggie also shared his thoughts on episode 6 bloody hell what a ride and more standout performance in one era than I saw in complete seasons of other shows Cindy was great and creepy and terrifying and obviously not stopped by a pissed off Stormfront electrocuting her which makes her even more creepy and terrifying but I love that performance I wanted her to explode even more people in future episodes or even better <laughs> can we get a splatter one shot movie with Cindy and did anyone else expect some sort of blood splatter as she got in that car well I kind of was expecting that the driver was going to be driving her somewhere so uh, maybe no I kind of thought she was going to do something like that and she would drive away. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, Chris continues, I'm still completely weirded out by the Church of the Collective plot. It's a slow burn, but I'm more and more interested where they're going with it. Homefront was icky as hell, but wow, was it fun to watch Aya Cash and Tony Starr acting their butts off in those scenes. And Stormfront's backstory is even more Nazi than I would have expected. That Himmler was a good dancer quote was so on, po- on point for a diehard Nazi. I feel bad but I felt for her personal parts with the death of her daughter and her line, everyone I love is in the ground. I love this show for how they can make even the most evil character three-dimensional and give her some humanity. It was much more fun to watch Starlight and Butcher and their relationship evolving with their love, friendship, respect for Huey as their common ground. Oh, and the Frenchie. Do we need to call him Surge now? And Lamplighter arc? Wow, that hurt. So much trauma for everybody. Excellent feedback, Chris. (laughs) Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, that was that was really mm-hmm. uh, really good. And and you're right. I th- I think um, yeah, the three dimensional characters in yeah. this show are just so good. I mean, I, you know, even with the reverse that we saw with with Starlight, really not having much empathy at all when um, she has killed the man on the ground. She just thought he was stupid for pulling a gun. Yeah. And you know. It, it, it's really uh, great stuff uh, from the show. Absolutely, like you know, we talked about this before a little bit with um, Umbrella Academy. You know, these the the idea of a, a monthly comic coming out. It's only about twenty pages long, and the character development that actually goes on in comic books, rather than you know a graphic novel where it's you know you pick up a proper novel that's got images in it. And it can tell you, take you on a full story. With comic books, it tends to be you come back every month, you pick up your comic book, and you read your story of the character, and they're kind of the same as they were last month, 
and the year before and maybe 30 years before that. Whereas a TV show like this is able to develop the characters a lot more. Like the boys as a comic book yeah. is great, but kind of you pick up issue 60 and it's kind of the same Billy Butcher as was in issue 20. You know, it's not, not a massive progression of the character and, and development that's in there. Definitely with Umbrella Academy, we saw that the only character development that some of the characters get in Umbrella Academy was in the TV show. There's hardly any at all in yeah. all of the comic books. Uh, so, so I, I, I do think they've used this to the best benefit. Having a writer like Eric Kripke on board, who, you know, spearheaded a show that ran for 15 series. Uh, he's very good at, at developing characters and creating uh, three dimensional characters. So great stuff. Excellent feedback, Chris. Yes. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, essentially, it come in my, I will call out Invincible and uh saga as to that book that trend, mm-hmm, absolutely uh would show huge character growth. now again not all comic books like iron man uh, but again that took nearly 60 70 <laughs> years for his character to evolve yeah. and a final piece of feedback just snuck in while i was editing uh, from jimmy uren over to feedback at tv podcast industries.com jimmy says i really like how the writers have managed to balance the storylines of so many different characters this season last week was mm's episode but this was finally frenchy getting his turn with some backstory which was great as i really didn't know uh, much about him I'm also increasingly impressed with Karen Fukuhara's acting, as for a mute character, she has to do so much with her body language and facial expressions, which works really well here, as well as the choice of jewellery. At first, I wrongly thought it might be a language thing, but watching some in- interviews with her on Prime, she is actually really chatty, so it must be hard for her to be so restrained, and probably explains why she takes it all out on the guards. Unfortunately, I was not quite as sold on Lamplighter. I just could not tell if he was just very remorseful or jubilous. But for someone who had been built up as something of a big bad, he felt a little underwhelming. Given the similarities, down to the Zippo lighter, I would have preferred them to actually get Aaron Stamford in to effectively reprise his role as Pyro and be a full-on bad guy. Yes, having an Asylum episode is a bit of a trope, and this felt part Arkham and part New Mutants, to the extent that I half expected Hugh Jackman to have a cameo. But of course, being the boys, it was done really well, and this was another great week of TV. I just wish there were more than two episodes left now, but great to hear we'll be getting a season three. P.S. I genuinely had to look up Love Sausage as a character to make sure you guys weren't having me on. thanks so much jimmy we'd never lie to you what are you talking about <laughs> uh yeah it's a really good feedback there um yeah karen fukuhara is so good and i really love seeing her on the behind the scenes uh, interviews she's just seems to, she's such a lovely person and really chatty uh it must be so difficult for her i know exactly what you mean um as for lamplatter i loved how they weaved the storyline into the show uh to be honest of of what actually happened and how remorseful he does feel uh obviously we see from this episode uh, a very different end to lamplatter but um but that would actually actually been quite interesting casting if they got Aaron Stanford in uh, to to reprise his role for the X-Men movies as, as Pyra that's a, a really a really fun bit of casting that they could have done I kind of like the the fire and ice thing though with uh, with Sean Ashmore up there it's very cool thanks Jimmy back to the end of the podcast so before we finish up our feedback we have one final voicemail from the one and only Steve Brown is Carl Urban's accent getting thicker? Like, he's getting harder to understand, even with subtitles on. Hello, TV Podcast Industries. This is Steve. This is for uh, the latest episode of The Boys, Season 2, Episode 6, uh, The Bloody Doors Off. Um, wow. Um, gosh. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't I can't make the, the statement that this season is better than last season, but man, it's really good. And uh, we're getting some really good stuff. Uh, let me see if I can break it down in order because there was so much intermingled here. It's going to be hard to separate some of them, but I will give uh, one of probably my boys moment is going to be uh, Carl Urban and uh, Billy Butcher and Starlight uh, kind of bonding there, standing over Huey in his hospital bed. That was so cute to see the two of them and talking about him and, and just you can see the mutual love they really do have. For, for him, uh, for the character, and I really uh, enjoyed that scene a lot. Uh, the action was really good. The reveal that uh, Sean Ashmore is uh, is Lamplighter was uh, wow. Um, but my seven moment, let's see, uh, it has to be that moment when, uh, and I will pick one out from a different point, but uh, 
when Stormfront is in the room with Lamplighter and the guy that Lamplighter ends up killing, she says, she's talking about the subjects, and I really started to get that inkling that, oh, she's part of this experiment. And so then, of course, that reveal at the end that she was uh, involved in in everything. So uh, the the big moment. But wow, just so much in this in this episode, that cold open uh, with uh, <laughs> Homelander and Stormfront, just so creepy. And then him, uh, you know, seeing his temper. And I, I don't know if her truth revealing is going to help. <laughs> truth revealing. <laughs> I just realized I said that. Okay, I'm almost two minutes, so talk to you later. You know, I think after every episode of The Boys, this gap of a week before the next episode comes up is necessary just to piece what happens together. Uh, Because you're right, Steve, so much uh, goes on in each episode. Thanks so much for your feedback. Yeah, thanks, Steve, for the feedback. Um, Yeah, a lot went on in uh, last week's episode. I was saying, like, is Stormfront playing Homelander? Is Homelander... I say, before he goes in for the kiss, is it going to be a little quick jerk to the left <laughs> with the neck of Stormfront? Uh, it's really uh, difficult uh, to know sometimes. And I think that's it, it's one of those shows that really puts me on edge yeah. uh, week in, week out, because I'm expecting some form of uh, laser uh, death or like this week mm-hmm. with exploding heads, uh, something happening uh, unexpectedly. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely, unexpectedly. Thank you so much, Steve. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks to everybody for your feedback. If you want to send us some feedback, once again, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can pop over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tvpodcastindustries. Uh, leave your thoughts on our spoiler post that we put up for each episode of the show. John, I think it's time to pop on over quickly to the pub for our weekly pub quiz question. Most definitely join us for a pint of mild, um, yes. as uh, Billy Butcher had in, in this week's episode. Or it is all six, yeah. <laughs> six, yeah. It is the boys' pub quiz. So, question seven: What cell is Starlight being held in in Vort Tower? Hmm. Interesting. W- yes. What cell is Starlight being held in in Vort Tower? Uh, please send your answer through uh, our email at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com mm-hmm. and of course you'll be in with a chance to win some the boys goodies uh, which will include um a collected uh, first volume of the boys uh, amongst a few other things mm-hmm. and hopefully there will be a nice pint glass now for uh, billy butcher's <laughs> pint of mild um on uh, amazon on the the boys uh, site there on amazon who knows it it would be great wouldn't it but you know again they've set up the site for the release of the tv show and apparently it seems like all of the new stuff for season two is only being released um, in like march or april next year so we're not going to make it make you wait that long we will have uh, the winner of our pub quiz uh, in our wrap-up episode for the boys season two which will be coming out towards uh, the middle towards the end of october so uh, so we'll have um hopefully a ton of you uh, answering all of our pub quiz questions uh, if you want to catch up on any of the pub quiz questions if you missed any of them pop over to our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries i put the questions in for each of the episodes uh in there yes or you can head on over to tv podcast industries.com where you can download each and every episode of our podcast and you can listen to them and then at the end you will hear our pub quiz you can also go on over to any good or evil vault or boys affiliated podcast catcher, Podbean, the usual places, etc. Pod, pod chaser, uh, podcast addict, uh, you name it. We are there. We're also on Amazon podcasts as of last mm-hmm. week. Thank you so much to our intrepid, amazing producer, <laughs> Derek, for getting us through all the hoops to get us on there so pretty much wherever you want to listen to us we are now available mm-hmm. of course anything um you can do to help support our small little podcast is always greatly appreciated you can support us by sharing the podcast because sharing the podcast is sharing the love don't forget you can also write a review because a good old five-star review does great wonders for promoting us and getting us up we also love hearing them too (laughs) yes it's also nice to see or you can also just head on over to patreon.com slash tv podcast industries where for a single dollar 
because doing that it helps us keep the lights on it keeps the engine running and the hamster in the wheel that powers our microphones. He keeps calling me a hamster. Every single week Chris calls me the <laughs> hamster that powers our microphones. <laughs> I'm just an editor, <laughs> an occasional producer and sometime co-host well, of the podcast. you do store your foods in your cheeks. <laughs> I do, but that's only something you know, John. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. We'll be back with the final episode of The Boys Season 2, Episode 8, What I Know Next Week. Um, Not what I know next week. What I know is the name of the episode. We will release the boys episode next week. We are also covering Lovecraft Country, the weirdest, craziest, most terrific show on television at the moment. Uh, it is fantastic. If you didn't see uh, this week's episode, episode seven of Lovecraft Country, you have to watch it all the way through to the end. It's a magnificent uh, episode of TV. At least we thought so. Yeah, a magnificent psychedelic trip mm. through other worlds. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The multiverse is alive in Lovecraft Country. Mm-hmm. Gotta be that, that way for you, John. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Yes, thank you so much. And I would just like to use this last 30 seconds to call out the amazing news that the one the only Samuel L. Jackson, one and only Nick Fury, is getting his own yes. show on Disney+. Yep. Plus. And I will officially put it here. We kind of said it on our Facebook group. Of course, we have the number one Nick Fury fan in the room. Well, not in this room because we're on different rooms. <laughs> but yes, Derek is the number one fan. So, of course... We will be covering that show whenever it airs. And do you know what? You're not going to get a Chris's Corner. You're not going to get a John's Corner. You're going to get a Derek's Absolutely. Corner. Absolutely. I'll be breaking open my shield files for that one. Can't, uh, can't wait to see what they do with, uh, with Samuel L. Jackson. They've been talking about a Samuel L. Jackson-led uh, movie for Nick Fury right back to his first appearance in Iron Man 1. Before any of the other movies were announced, there was actually an IMDb uh, thing. I don't know, IMDb is like Wikipedia. Anybody can write it. But uh, there was there were updates going up all the time. There was going to be a S.H.I.E.L.D.-led or a Nick Fury-led S.H.I.E.L.D. movie right back then. And then eventually we had Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for seven seasons, a wonderful Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And now we're going to be getting a Samuel L. Jackson-led Nick Fury show. Last week was a good week for me when I found that yeah. news out. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Looking yeah, forward to it. Yes. Congratulations, Derek. And thank you so much, fellow listeners. And we'll speak to you again soon. Bye. Yeah, thanks so much, fellow boys and girls, for joining us. It is great having you on board the podcast, and it's great to discuss these things with you. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep burning brightly. (laughs) Bye. 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 Keep burning brightly. 